Video games are a unique medium for loads of reasons, but the one I would like to focus on today is how our possibilities within it are so intrinsically tied to technology. The N64 supports perspective correct textures, meaning we can build huge environments with very few assets and stream them into the system's memory at lightning speeds thanks to the reliance on cartridges. Try to achieve anything similar on the PlayStation and you'll have to divide levels up into these contained chunks connected by loading tunnels if you don't want the graphics to become completely distorted. That's why a game like Spyro stands out so much among its peers for achieving things the system wasn't designed for. What you don't see on the N64, however, are hyper-detailed pre-rendered backgrounds or elaborate FMV cutscenes. This is how the PS1 built such a reputation for cinematic, story-heavy games. It's just what made the most sense for the platform. Any piece of art will have to shape itself around some level of limitations, and yet it's still easy to see how lifting those limitations through the power of time and hindsight might be appealing? What if we could get rid of the scene transitions in Resident Evil 2 or clear the fog in Turok, realizing an old concept to its fullest potential, breathing new life into work we're already familiar with? Hell yeah! So why is it that Link's Awakening on Switch makes us all want to bust out those three funny digits on our credit cards, but something like The Lion King remake has us all groaning? When I say video games are more intrinsically tied to technology than any other form of entertainment, I mean that in a very physical way. Remember the PS2's emotion engine? If you want to play Final Fantasy X, then guess what, you'll either need this thing to be physically present, or the game's entire code will have to be rewritten from scratch for a modern platform. The very nature of the medium, where graphics and calculations need to be put on the screen by a computer in real time, means that there's always going to be so much more work involved for a re-release than with, say, an album or a movie. My mom bought her Michael Jackson CDs like 30 years ago, and uh, yeah, they still work on my PC, because they're not beholden to a platform holder like a console game would be. Now, of course, it would make our lives a lot easier if companies like Sony implemented a universal backwards compatibility solution for their latest console, but it only takes one glance at Nintendo's history of experimental hardware to know that that's not entirely realistic. Eventually, there has to be a cutoff if you want technology to move forward. I do believe we're at a point now, however, where you can buy a video game on a modern system and be pretty safe in the knowledge that your purchase will carry over to the next generation of hardware, just because our tech is so streamlined these days. But that still doesn't take care of this massive back catalogue of titles that you have no way of purchasing on your PS4 or Xbox. If you want people to give you money for Spyro again, your options are to either build some kind of PS1 emulator, or take the assets and rewrite the game from scratch. And if you want to do it right, then guess what? Either method will require time and dedication and uh money. So what we're looking at here is a sizable investment with the goal of turning a profit. And the number one rule in this kind of scenario is that you'll want to maximize your audience. And the reality is that we culturally do not have a widespread appreciation for pixel art or low poly 3D. TLDR, if you want all the kids to buy it, it can't look like this. It has to look like this. And you know that's great and all, but we've already established that technology is an inseparable part of the art form. Resident Evil flat out wouldn't be what it is had they not had to rely on still images to build its world. And I think a lot of people would agree that what it is is beautiful, and that a game that plays like this still has value. But I also believe that this idea extends to aesthetics. We all intuitively understand that Transformers being a newer movie with fewer limitations doesn't mean it looks better than, uh... Casablanca, right? And I think we need to get to that same point with video games. Refine your aesthetic sensibilities to where you can look at Final Fantasy IX and realize, hey, this is actually one of the most beautiful looking games ever made. Composition, framing, color theory, silhouettes, these are all universal concepts unbeholden to things like pixel count or number of polygons on screen. So no, I can't look at those Spyro remakes as an objective improvement. They're a lateral move where the overall impression is entirely dependent on your personal taste. And while I don't really mind the way they look, I'm not that attached to Spyro to be honest, I think there's something inherently pretty sad about this state of affairs. I said earlier that we can't 
can safely assume that future hardware will be fully backwards compatible now, meaning if you're gonna play Spyro on your PlayStation 6, it's gonna be this version. Eventually, there will come a point where the remake will have been the most recent iteration of Spyro for longer than the original was. The latter will fade into obscurity like it never existed in the first place, just like everything else you've ever loved, because we're all little more than tiny cogs in one gigantic uncaring universe where the mere idea of our overall insignificance in it fills us with insurmountable dread. <gasps> But let me play devil's advocate for a minute. Crash Team Racing Nitro Field is like the best game I've played this year that's not the MC5. 95% of that is thanks to its galaxy brain driving mechanics, which were obviously present in the PlayStation original, and don't get me wrong, that's a great game, but I gotta say that going back and forth between the two, it can be understated just how much the updated presentation adds to the remake. The intense motion blur as you zip around corners, the way your tires get visibly dirty and leave thick trails in the mud. The even more exaggerated and over-the-top body language of the racers making it feel like they're truly driving for their lives. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is so much more visceral and stimulating to me purely thanks to these little touches. Where Beanox really knocked it out of the park though is how thoughtfully they've updated the available game modes and quality of life features. The new Nitro Wheels option essentially puts the boost gauge on your driver so that you can tell exactly when to hit L1 for a perfect boost without having to move your eyes to the edge of the screen, but it's turned off by default for those who enjoyed that aspect of the original. The classic adventure mode is fully intact, but there's a new variant that lets you change drivers at will on the same save file. And of course, there is an online mode now, which literally wasn't possible on the PlayStation and justifies the existence of this remake by itself if you ask me. It's not perfect, the load times are pretty long, uh, actually it is perfect because it's on the Switch. So to answer my own question from earlier, yes, there absolutely can be value in lifting the those limitations. We obviously have these objective advancements that I just mentioned, but the potential improvements to a game's feel or tone can't be understated. Or to put it another way, polish is important. Polish alone adds so much. Look at a remake like Wonder Boy Dragon's Trap. The mechanics are completely unaltered from the Master System original, and yet the graphics overhaul makes it feel like an entirely new game. The core conceit here is exploring a big, mysterious world, so you can imagine how much it improves the experience when every single backdrop is now dripping with atmosphere, where the architecture now implies history and life. It's like he said, polish is important, but it's also hella subjective. The visual style they went with here is completely original. The team at Lizard Cube did not use the old sprite work or even the Master System concept art as a basis. If you grew up with this game, then yeah, I can see why you wouldn't vibe with this aesthetic. And that's why it's great that they included the original art style as an option in the this remake. This is really the crux of my argument. Overhauling certain aspects because it might improve the overall experience, or perfectly preserving a piece of art in its unaltered form. They're each valid goals that don't have to be mutually exclusive to each other. The problem really is how the big evil companies are always trying to get away with less. The truth is that you can actually buy a lot of the games I've mentioned so far for digital downloads, just not on the PS4 because Sony, and even when we're lucky enough to have basically a one-to-one -one port of a game on a modern console, chances are they'll either nickel and dime us for every subsequent re-release, or that a lot of issues and inaccuracies have snuck their way in. Often both. The Devil May Cry remasters seem bare bones at worst, but compare them with their respective PS2 versions and you'll find that the extra touch of polish, the last, say, 20% that really pull the visuals together, are just missing here. The per-object motion blur that gives every attack that little bit of extra oomph is present on the PlayStation 3 version of the remaster, but conspicuously absent everywhere else. And even on PS3 it doesn't look quite right. DMC1's first person underwater segments use a different and worse looking filter, the BGM doesn't loop properly, Kalina Ant's gunslinger attack literally just doesn't work on 360 and PS3, but the worst part for me is the textures, man. Every single HD re-release applies this hideous looking scaling filter to all of the textures. It looks smeary and oversaturated saturated and somehow blurrier than the original art. They do this to hide how pixelated the textures are, which you only realize once the game is rendered in HD clarity, and uh, duh, maybe that tells you that most older games just don't make sense in HD 
Yoshi. Hmm. There was a little bit of outcry when DMC1 first released on PC, but we only tend to point these issues out when they're extremely blatant. Okami HD and Zodiac Age are, in my opinion, some of the worst offenders with this texture stuff, and yet I never really hear peep about it. This goes back to what I said about our surface level appreciation of aesthetics. It has to be like Final Fantasy VI mobile level for people to start raising eyebrows. I mentioned Final Fantasy IX earlier, and the 2016 HD version is honestly up there as one of the worst remasters of all time for me, with its disgusting backgrounds, tacky menus, and broken analog controls. And this stuff will keep happening as long as we keep supporting shoddy re-releases like the Grandia Collection or Resident Evil 4 HD. What I'm about to say is probably going to sound insane to you, but hear me out. I would rather have no Grandia on Switch than a shitty version of Grandia on Switch. We're a lazy species, and we'll always go with the most convenient option if it exists. If you don't give people that easy out, maybe they'll actually have an incentive to seek out the original and get the best experience, huh? Because selfishly, yeah, I would rather they go to the effort of playing RE4 on GameCube the way it was intended than to end up thinking the game is bad because they ruined the visuals and added an analog dead zone bigger than the brain inside my skull that is producing all these good words. <laughs> I'll go a step further and say that I'd rather see a series die with dignity than dragged back into the spotlight kicking and screaming and have its reputation permanently tarnished by a lackluster re-release. As much as people want it to tell me that I'm wrong, that's exactly what happens with The World Ends With You, and it's what's going to happen with Panzer Dragoon later this year. With both of these cases, there was or is this hope that a financial success may lead to good things later down the line, but that's not a logical proposition. When Sony announced they were remaking Shadow of the Colossus, they did it with the hashtag, it's happening. And that's so exemplary of the kinds of reactions and feelings they were trying to evoke. Thing is back, so please give us money, it doesn't matter if we actually did a good job. It's monetizing hype, nothing more, and it needs to stop. It makes me sad to see people look at a release like the Mana Collection and say, ugh, pff, lol, I'm not paying 40 bucks for ROMs, when companies like M2 put so much love and care into meticulously recreating classic games with accurate emulation and no extra input lag. Translating Seiken Densetsu 3 into English for the first time and inserting that translation into the original ROM is like a $40 effort by itself, guys. Even this remaster isn't perfect though, the pixel perfect option on the Super Nintendo title still scales the horizontal axis to 4x3, meaning sharp pixels at the correct aspect ratio but with loads of shimmering and general unevenness. The optional bilinear filtering solves this issue and still looks surprisingly sharp, though these days some kind of pixel interpolation like in Sonic Mania would be the preferred option. Keep in mind this was a launch window release for the Switch in Japan. Uh, also, I wish you could turn off the background. I'm not trying to flex here when I say that most people don't even seem to really understand these technical details. As important as homebrew emulators are for preservation, I think they're a big reason why so many people look at older games as kind of disposable. If you're not sensitive to input lag, if you don't care about accuracy, if you don't mind the odd audio crackle or a visual glitch, then yeah, maybe pirating every GBA game and playing them on your phone is good enough for you. It's sad developers and publishers are made to feel like they need to turn every classic into an epic 3D mega game to provide an artificial sense of value. I can say with absolute certainty that we're not gonna have this pricing debate once the Trials of Mana remake sits on store shelves by itself for $40. Trials of Mana 2020 is also a great example of this larger trend of video games remakes that flat out replace entire parts of the titles they're based on. Turning a 2D top-down RPG into a full 3D action game is a massive change with huge implications to every part of the mechanics and the design. To this day, I see people think of remakes like RE2 or the upcoming FF7 as hyper-expensive reissues of older titles, but that's assuming that what makes a video game a video game is purely the overall structure and premise, when in fact simply aiming in third person turns RE2 into a completely different experience. What makes this kind of remake such a sticky, complicated issue is just how much the lines are being blurred. I don't think it's presumptuous of me to say that Yakuza Kiwami is clearly trying to be a replacement for 
for Yakuza on PlayStation 2, and yet their approach to this idea is a lot more liberal than the careful updates of a game like Crash Nitro Fueled. The original mechanics and assets aren't even being recreated here. Instead, they're totally replaced with completely different mechanics and assets from other Yakuza games. Now, I guess you can still subjectively think that shoehorning Yakuza Zero's engine into the first game's overall story is an improvement, and uh, I'd heavily disagree with you on that, but that's beside the point. What you can't disagree with me on, and this is my point, is that that approach to remaking a game just isn't true to the original spirit. Like it or not, controls, mechanics, and camera systems are part of the identity of a game, and they deserve to be retained just as much as the aesthetics do. Like, that's the whole crux of these video game things, you know, it's all part of the language of the medium, and the individual components of this language aren't interchangeable like that. If your idea of improving an older game is to swap out parts of it wholesale with another game, you're not really being respectful to the integrity of either title, are you? Okay, 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 but what about? RE2 though. What about FF7 though? Ugh, I don't know, man. RE2 2019, really cool game. I can't even sit here and say that I would have preferred them to use this kind of budget to make like a new game, because like we discussed, all these changes and additions make it a new game. Dynamic AI, a full body damage model, boarding up windows. These ideas aren't just new to RE2, they're new to Resident Evil, period. This remake takes advantage of its relationship to the original RE2 to build on concepts from that game in unexpected ways, and use your memories of that experience against you. Dipping back into that well also gives them an excuse to go for this slick, retro yet modern aesthetic and breathe new life into iconic, well-established characters. That's not something RE8 will be able to do, really, and that's why this whole thing has value to me. And don't get it twisted, I don't mean to say that this layer of separation makes RE2 2019 exempt from scrutiny. Just like when adapting a book into a movie or something, you're you're free to be critical of it if you feel like the material is handled in a way you find distasteful or that the changes, cuts, and additions cause it to just not work in this form. Still, I think it's easy to see why the prospect of something like FF7 Remake is so enticing. Not as a replacement for the original, but as a complementary piece. And yet, I think at this point you'll understand why I'm still apprehensive. I hope I've painted a clear enough picture of how we don't value the craft and the language behind old games as much as we should. And that the industry is well aware of this and will happily exploit that fact, the truth of the matter is that there are countless people who jumped into RE2 Remake and have zero interest in the original. And this wouldn't concern me nearly as much as it does if the original were just, like, on Steam or something, but it's not. It's not my place to lay down hard rules for how video game remakes should be done. Basic preservation via unaltered, respectfully maintained ports of classic games, though, that should be the bare minimum. I think we can all agree that that's the point we need to get to. To. It doesn't matter how much people hate Twin Snakes when the original is always right there at your fingertips, eh? Beyond that, I guess I just want you to look at future video game remakes the same way you would at the new Lion King, and that's by asking yourself, does this have value, and are they treating this with respect? I haven't played the Link's Awakening remake, but I'm not seeing the value in this graphical change when every single screen in the original already had so much charm and detail put into it, especially when it doesn't even manage to run at the same frame rate or that Link's movement speed has to be slowed down drastically to accommodate for the seamless 3D camera. And I don't feel like I'm being treated with respect either when they're charging 60 bucks for this thing while the original is available on 3DS for a fiver. Again, the lines between recreation and reinterpretation are extremely blurry and subjective, but personally, there's nothing that would compel me to play this over the original other than the simple fact that it's a shiny new version of this game I already like. It's marketing your nostalgia rather than just making a product you actually want. Does that sound familiar? All. I think laying things out like that clearly exposes how calculated and slimy a lot of these releases are at their core, and I hope that that's when it becomes a lot easier to just say no.